So this is uh, Zachary Menneker. He is going to talk about how to get mumps 30 years later with some more stuff added on that you can read. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Good to go. All right. Uh, let me just set my timer here real quick, and then we will get going. Okay. What's up? I, I, I think I already do. I recognize you from the office. Yeah, all right, yeah, yeah. All right, cool. Um, yeah, thanks for coming, everybody. Uh, this is uh, How to Get Mumps 30 Years Later. Uh, my name's uh, Zach Miniker. Um, yeah, so to just start, I'm gonna uh, just give you a little bit of a, an agenda of what we're gonna talk about here. First, I'm just gonna talk about like the history of the thing we're, we're talking about here. Uh, I'm gonna talk about like how to break mumps, how to break an EMR that's called Vista. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about like the the future and the past of these things. Um, before I start, I just want to say, just get some definitions going. Um, first, I'm going to say EMR throughout, uh, by which I mean electronic medical records, uh, which is just like software that is used to maintain patient records, stuff like that. Uh, I'm also going to say VA throughout, by which I mean the Department of Veterans Affairs, uh, which handles concerns for veterans in the United States, chiefly for what we care about their medical care after they're out of the, the uh, military. Uh, and then I'm also going to talk about FOIA, uh, which is the Freedom of Information Act, which basically you can, you can submit a form to the government that says, I want information about this specific thing. Uh, and as long as it's not, as long as they don't have a reason to say no, they give it to you, basically. Um, yeah, cool. So who am I? Like I said, my name is Zachary Miniker. Uh, I work for a company called Security Innovation. Uh, I don't work for the government. Um, I, you know, I break stuff for a living. Uh, I also used to work in healthcare, kind of, sort of, uh, and now I just, like, work on breaking healthcare stuff for fun. Uh, and I care a lot about, like, the history of a lot of the, the software that we use. You know, like, I'm a real big fan of the PDP-11, for example. Uh, yeah, also, I'm speaking on behalf of myself and not of my employer. Um, and also, I made these slides in an ANSI text editor called Mobius, uh, and they should be available on the media server uh, under the name, like the title of the talk, .info. They're not up there right now, but I will get those up there. Um, yeah. So anyway, so what's this talk about? Um, in healthcare, there's a language called mumps that effectively undergirds a ton of modern, like, healthcare infrastructure, right? You've probably seen this XKCD. Uh, you've got on the left there a, these towers that say all of digital infrastructure, and then there's a little block that says, you know, random project maintained by somebody in Nebraska since 20, uh, 2003. Um, this talk is sort of about hitting that block with a hammer. It's basically what we're trying to do here. Um, so, like I said, we're going to talk a little bit about like the history of the things involved here. Um, so, where the hell did mumps come from? Um, in 1966, there was a group of engineers that were working for uh, Dr. Octo Barnett uh, in, uh, at Mass General Hospital in, in Boston. Um, including uh, Neil Papalardo, that were, they started working on this new language that they called the Massachusetts General Hospital Utility Multi-Programming System, which of course shortens to MUMPS. Uh, there are, is some movement now to call it the M language. I'm going to refer to it as MUMPS throughout because I think it's a more fun name. Um, but yeah. So MUMPS was specifically imagined as a language for healthcare environments. Um, it was originally written allegedly for PDP-9s, um, and then Digital Equipment Corporation grabbed it and they uh, turned it into like a standalone OS for, for PDP-11s that they called MUMPS-11. Um, some, some records say that like originally it was deployed on PDP-7s. Uh, um, but yeah, there's also, it, it has a lot of influ influence from a language called BBNN Telecomp, um, which I say mostly just to say that like, this is a pre-Unix language. This is a pre-C language. This is like, this is before the, the, the standard concept of how programming works as you and I know it, right? Um, and so originally it wasn't like a language, it was an environment. It was everything you needed to make software for healthcare like uses. Um, 
So uh, as just an example of like one of the little oddities here, there wasn't an e a Unix epoch, right? There was no, you know, number of minutes since or number of seconds since 1970, right? So instead they have this variable that's called orlog that has two numbers separated by a comma and the first number is the number of days since January 1st, 1841. And the whole reason for that is because their assumption was that the oldest living veteran that they would have to give health care to fought in the Civil War. And that was their like measure that they went for. So yeah, also the maximum data can support is like December 31st, 9999. Uh, so like Y2K compliant, which, you know, good job. Really thinking ahead there. Um, and yeah, so originally like mumps wasn't super well standardized. It was this idea that they were playing around with. It showed up in, in PDPs. It showed up all over the place. Uh, but eventually the VA hired two engineers uh, and said, hey, there's this new thing. Like let's look into doing something with this. Um, and they eventually, they started working on this suite of utilities over at the, the VA that eventually sort of coalesced into this single total EMR that they called VISTA, capital V, capital A real cute name. Um, and like the people who were working on this was this group that was called the Hard Hats. And just as an example of like the, the, the people we're talking about, they're still around and this is their website as of 2021. Um, absolutely incredible. Uh, like these, these folks are, are really going for it. So like Vista, this, this EMR that they were working on, Vista, it sort of grew throughout the years. It got bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and it became like really well loved and well respected. On the one hand, this is like, you have people that have a need for software and they're making it themselves, right? This is like for doctors by doctors effectively, right? On the other hand, it's effectively like shadow IT as a development strategy. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, there was a lot of uh, working that needed to be done to get stuff to, to you know, fit together basically. Mumps the language um, was, was and is extremely fast. Uh, it's no SQL partially because it beat SQL to market. Uh, also partially because like it fits every definition of no SQL. Um, and it's like it's perfect for like anytime you've got data that needs a lot of, a lot of rights. Banks, sciences, hospitals, right? Uh, in like nowadays like Vista is still like widely deployed at basically every VA hospital. Um, doctors really love it, like people who have interacted with it love it. Uh, hospitals outside of the VA system like use Vista for, for certain things. Um, there's inside of the VA, there's this, this effort to like modernize their EMR, uh, which means that they're like trying to move, they're trying to get rid of Vista, uh, but it's still deployed all over the place. Um, and yeah, like mumps is, is like still widely used even outside of healthcare. There's, uh, some of the biggest EMRs in the world use it. Core banking systems use it. Um, the European Space Agency has deployed it like within the decade, I believe, or within the last decade, which like it's still, people are still finding uses for it. Um, if you want to join me on this adventure, you can install Mumps by running in Ubuntu or Debian, uh, sudo apt install hyphen y fis gtm, uh, which will install FIS is gt.m. You need that hyphen Y because if you even think about installing mumps, you must. So like you, you have to have apt install it for you. Um, and Vista you can actually just get. At some point it got FOIA'd is my understanding. Um, this appears to have started somewhere in like September of 2004. Um, but like it just, somebody at the VA just uploads it to an FTP server every month. And like whatever the most modern version of, of Vista is, it just every year it come, you can, or every month you can just grab a new version. Um, so we're going to talk about like a couple of different, uh, you know, we're going to talk about like mumps a little bit. Uh, I'm not going to talk a whole lot about how Vista works, but I just kind of wanted to ask like, ha has anyone in here like written any mumps? I know there's at least one person. Okay, so we've got two people, three people. All right. That's, yeah, oh, oh, wait, okay. So we've got like, you know, less than 10. Makes sense, all right, yeah. Look at, mumps is a cool language. Uh, I'm gonna demonstrate to you that it's a cool language. Um, first off, in mumps, three plus six times two is 18. 
Uh, so if we, if we think about like our order of operations here, six times two is 12, plus three is 15, right? So that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. The reason why this is happening is because all math is strictly evaluated from left to right. Yeah, um, it gets weirder from here. We're gonna, we're gonna keep going. In general, like I find it to be a pretty readable language, um, but it's from a time where like, like size for, for uh, uh, computers was at like a really high premium, right? So a lot of code isn't commented. It just isn't because they didn't want to have to store it. There's some, on some implementations, there's a performance cost to actually having comments in the code. Um, and then also a lot of the keywords in the language can be shortened down to single characters, uh, which, you know, gets kind of wild. So like, Here's just an example of some mumps. Um, I don't believe this runs, but it like, you know, it looks okay. Um, and if you notice, I just want to point out at the bottom, the third to last line there, you have period, space, the word else, and then space, space, the word do, and then there's a semicolon for the, the, the comment. Those two spaces after the else are important because like white space is significant in the language. Um, it's, you know, you can, you can do some stuff with it, but it's significant. Um, but like I said, you can shorten a lot of keywords down to single characters. So we can go from that to that, right? Uh, extremely, like, honestly, still kind of readable. As long as, like, everything stays just sort of short per line, like, everything's cool, right? But we can go smaller, right? There is no reason to stop at only, like, if you think about how code is written, Usually, it flows from top to bottom, right? This is, this is an invention that does not need to exist. What if, instead of writing your code vertically, you wrote it horizontally, right? So, that same code can be turned into that, right? This is basically code golf. Like, this is, this is enterprise code golf. And in fact, if you go on, like, some code golf forums, like, people are using this language to do code golf. Like, it's just, yeah, it's a great language for it. Um, and I'm not, like, I am not cherry-picking here. Like, this is actual source from Vista. Um, and, like, this is how readable it is, right? If you look at that first line, you have, like, N, space, and then a couple variable names. Uh, and then the line below it, you have set D sub equals zero. That's just, like, setting a variable to a certain value. Space, four, space, space, set D sub equal to, and then, like, you know, a bunch of, like, there is a... Like, that is how this code gets written, is like entire for loops on one line, you know? Here's like another example. In, for some reason in the Vista source code, there doesn't seem to be like a strong coding style that was enforced. There's no linters for this language, right? So like, in this case, you have if written literally as if, you know, like they're literally using if, but then like new and set are just single characters, right? Um, yeah, it's like, this language gets rough to look at. Um, but like on modern implementations, now that we've talked about like writing the code, right? We need to like run the code. Generally, Mumps is described as both like a, both an interpreted and also a compiled language. So on the one hand, you can, you know, write your code and then tell Mumps like, hey, run this code. And what it does is compile it, store that as a shared object, or at least gt.m and yada db do, I should be clear. Uh, it compiles it, stores that as a shared object, and then it loads that shared object into its memory space and then jumps into that code that you just wrote, right? Um, and so what that means is like you can deploy Vista code as just the source code, which is kind of small, and then compile on site, which is a pretty, you know, useful feature to have. Um, and yeah, it's, it's just, it's like, this is how it works in the, the modern era. Um, so like, like I said earlier, like just to, to be real clear about what we're talking about, that's the language mumps, right? Vista is written entirely in mumps. The way that I got it for this research is just by downloading it from that FTP server I mentioned. Um, and a lot of this is based on a certain flavor of the FOIA version of mumps. There's some modifications that get done to Vista sort of after the fact uh, that get you know, packaged into different distributions for different uses and stuff. Um, the 
if you are using a version of Vista that like is deployed using gt.m, for example, uh, usually you're storing your routines in a folder that's traditionally just called r slash. So if you follow me on this and you like, you know, use Vista that is, is deployed with gt.m using like Docker or something, look for that routines folder because it's going to have all of your source code in it. All right. So that's all of our history. So then I show up, right? So how did I actually get involved in this? So at, at Security Innovation, the company I work at, we have like research time where we, you know, look at interesting stuff, learn how to break new things, whatever. Um, and I've been using mine to kind of like systematically go through a bunch of different, you know, healthcare protocols, look at different EMRs, kind of, you know, do whatever. And like I had heard about Vista maybe like five or six years ago, and I, I didn't realize like I didn't realize it was mumps. I didn't realize how foundational mumps was to all of like a lot of healthcare stuff. I'll talk more about like where it's being used later. Um, and like places I had worked at in in hospitals had always used Java-based EMRs. So like I just never you know, never got a whole lot of exposure to mumps. Um, and on top of that, I desperately want to be cool. Uh, and like, I think hacking weird code is cool. And I think I've demonstrated that Vista is weird and like mumps is weird. So like, you know, thus we can play. Um, so yeah. So let me just talk about like what a deployment of Vista sort of looks like. It's basically this. So you have some hardware, some like x86 probably machine that you're running it on that you have an operating system that's running on, right? On top of that, you're running some sort of mumps implementation. For my use, this is either gt.m or yada db. Um, there's also a Windows uh, in implementation that's called cache that's pretty common. Um, and then on top of that is Vista. So in Vista, when you like, you know, make a new string or whatever, you're interacting, you're asking the mumps implementation to give you like memory to use as a string and it goes to the operating system to get that memory. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the way that in a actual hospital Vista gets used is that you have clients that talk to it using this, this RPC method that's called XWB. Um, a really common uh, client is CPRS. Uh, which I'll talk about in a sec here. Um, but yeah, that's the, our general map of what this, this thing looks like, right? So I go out and, and say like, I want to I wanna attack this as an attacker, I, or I want to attack this as a client. I want to just be able to show up at like a VA hospital, plug into a wall and go, right? So like I want to use, start with their, their client and then, you know, start exploring what I can do here, right? Uh, so I go and grab the most common Vista client, which is called CPRS. CPRS is really widely available. I think it's up on GitHub now. It's written in Delphi, so it's more readable than mumps. Um, and so yeah, so I install CPRS. I run a version of Vista that's deployed without TLS, which isn't hard. Uh, that'll come back later. Um, and then I start capturing packets, right? And so I get a lot of RPC traffic that looks like this. Um, and like, you know, ignoring like the, the, the normal like, you know, TCP stuff at the, at the bottom, we've got all this like ASCII at the bottom that I just don't really understand. If you look on like the third line, you can kind of make out that there's 127.0.0.1 that's on there. That makes sense. I'm running the server on localhost, but like I have no idea what's going on. And I can't really turn to the source code because at this point, this is, you know, like a year into this research and I don't know months. So like I'm going to do this in the dumbest way possible and just start looking for keywords in the source code. Um, and so when I'm like dragging through the source at some point, I start finding this uh, uh, code. And if you look here, uh, you'll notice there's a line that says type equals XR equals, and then in quotes, square bracket XWB, close quotes, right? That's our code that is like consuming the, this RPC traffic. So we've got like, we've got a way in, right? Um, so, like I said, don't want to learn mumps. Um, and so I turned to, to old reliable here, which is Bufuz. So uh, Bufuz, if you haven't used it, it is a Python library for um, basically making like network fuzzers where you don't really have to, you can just say like, here's what the network traffic looks like, go fuzz this thing, here's like the address. Um, but to do that, I need to capture a lot of traffic and then turn that traffic into this Bufuz script. Um, and if you use Vista for like with CPRS for like, you know, I don't know, 15 minutes or so, like you'll generate hundreds of RPC calls. So 
I start writing these, like notating these by hand into a Bufuz script, and I get through about 20 before I'm like, this is dumb. And I write a script that'll just create the, the Bufuz script for me. And then I end up with an 18,000 line Bufuz script that gets me nothing. I ran that for a couple of months, absolutely nothing. Um, so I switched tack. I'm, I think to myself, like, I don't necessarily, like, the network is slow, like, let's see if we can cut the network out. So I learn enough months to write a harness that will take input from standard in instead of from that, like, the, instead of from a socket, right? And it will still hit that RPC code. So after doing that, I can now use AFL++ in dumb mode, not have to worry about, like, instrumentation, just kind of, like, feed input into this thing and see if it dies, right? Um, and that also doesn't seem to be look, seem to be working. So I think to myself, like, what if I just like instrument it, and then I can see if code is actually getting hit, right? Um, and so, like, we need to talk a little bit about like instrumenting some mumps implementations here. Um, so there's two mumps implementations that I kind of care about for this research. The first one is GT.M. The other one is YadaDB. Uh, both of them are open source. YadaDB is based on GT.M because of some like historical reasons. Um, the Vista deployment that I was working on was based on GT.M. So I have like, already have like an, a stood up GT.M instance. YadaDB is very easy to get going if you want to uh, get it going. And both YadaDB and GT.M are written by like C wizards who are like way cooler than me. Um, and like they do everything they possibly can to like make C even faster. Uh, big parts of it are written in assembly, which is of, of GT.M and, and YADB, which is fascinating. Um, but all I have to do is make like three changes to the code to get like AFL to work, which is good for me. Um, and yeah, and so since I'm down here anyway and like instrumenting this underlying mumps implementation, I figured like I might as well just fuzz like the, the mumps implementation anyway, you know, like fuzz how it handles source code input. Um, and so to do that, YadaDB has all of these test-driven development, like, source code examples that are all, like, they all explore weird states, right? And so, like, that's a, a really perfect corpus for this. And in general, like, that's my advice. If you're fuzzing something that you don't understand, but they have code tests, just steal their code tests. You know, just steal their test inputs and just use those. Like, it's, it works a lot. Um, and then, yeah, at this point, I've written enough mumps that I can finally, like, read mumps. So now I can actually go through and, like, you know, read the, the, the source code and, you know, make some sense of it. So I start looking through the authentication, I start looking at the input handling, I start looking at how it interacts with the underlying system, mostly just looking for, like, quick wins and stuff. So we've got three, like, three pathways of attack here. First, we're fuzzing the Vista RPC uh, mechanisms using, like, a mumps harness and AFL++. Second, I'm just fuzzing how YadaDB and GT.M handle source code input um, using, like, YadaDB's uh, tests. And then third, I'm just looking through the code by hand, looking for anything weird that I can see, right? So what do we find? So first off, the RPC fuzzing got us just nothing. Um, there's a really boring technical reason for this that I'm not going to get into, but yeah, just absolutely nothing. Fuzzing YadaDB and GT.M got us 30 CVEs. Um, all of those are memory corruption bugs. It's everything from like buffer overflows to use after freeze to null pointer dereferences to everything you can possibly imagine. Um, and I want to be really clear about like what the attack surface for those looks like. This is, I'm talking about modifying source code that gets fed to the interpreter, right? So you have to be in a really specific spot to exploit these. Um, I don't think it's, I think it's easier than you would expect to get there, but yeah. Um, so cool, these CVEs are CVE 2021-44481 to 44510. Um, and like these bugs are weird. Um, like I said, like this is, this was written by like C Graybeards using every possible trick you can imagine. Um, and so there's all of these weird states that like ended up getting explored doing, doing all of this. So let's like take one of those bugs and like talk about it, right? So we're going to look at 44486. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the input. I'm going to show you the crash. We're going to talk about like why this crash is happening. And then I'm going to show you the crash again from like a different angle and show you like what actually is causing the, the memory corruption here. One sec. All right, so here we go. So um, 
first I'm just going to open that input um, and just kind of show this to you. This is the input that is going to cause the crash. Um, this is just like a non-minified input that the fuzzer found. Uh, if you look at this line here, uh, you can see this write command, which is actually what causes the crash to happen. Uh, so if I bail out of Vim real quick, I'm just going to run JadaDB in GDB. Uh, it is configured to just read that input and like try to create a source code or a, a shared object from that. And we get this seg fault, right? Uh, if we take a look at the state of the registers, uh, what we will see here is that rip is at this, the instruction pointer is at like 555C6950. And so if we look at like the instructions around that location, there's just sort of a bunch of garbage there. There's that instruction at the bottom that like GDB can't really make sense of. Um, and I'm going to talk about this later, but that's somewhere in the heap. Just trust me that that's in the heap. So if we look at like the line of source code that caused this crash, it's inside of op underscore write, and there's this call that uses io cur device dot out, and then arrow dispatch pointer. Um, if I print that, you can see that there's like some memory addresses in here that don't make a lot of sense to me, but there's also that uh, that write function pointer is at five 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 c six nine fifty, right? So. What's actually happening here, right? There's a specific order of strings being created and like attempts to compile the code that is corrupting some data structure in, in memory that contains a function pointer. So then later in the source code file that's being parsed, there's this call to write that where the function pointer gets corrupted and we just jump out into the middle of absolutely nowhere. So like in this case, we're jumping to somewhere in the middle of the heap, but like that's just purely chance in this case. Um, so the thing that's actually being corrupted is this iocur device dot out. Um, iocur device dot out is like the current input output device. It handles like taking input from the user and also like printing and emitting source code and stuff like that. Um, it has a dispatch table that's called DSP underscore PTR. And that dispatch table is just a bunch of function pointers that point to different functions that you can like rewrite on the fly if you need to change what the mumps implementation is doing. And then we are trying to perform the write function that's in that dispatch pointer using some input, right? So once the corruption happens, we end up with this where the that iocur device dot out just gets corrupted. So it's completely kind of destroyed. That dispatch pointer, excuse me, points to just somewhere randomly, um, which means that that write function call is completely random. You know, it's just some other, you know, it's just some area of memory, basically. Um, so, but like, why, like, why does that happen, right? And like, what actually is this, this corruption look like? Basically what we end up having is, is like these two objects in memory that are at the same like memory location. It's the, the, we're overlapping two chunks basically. I'll explain this more later. But like in other contexts, like if you're just doing like normal heap exploitation things, you can kind of get into a similar state using like a, a use after free or a double free. Um, and like let me, let me demonstrate that for you. Like we're gonna, I'm gonna look at that crash again, but we're gonna take a slightly different look and look at the way specifically that malloc is being called here. So. Um, let me restart the program, and then we're going to run it again with that same input just and see what happens, right? Uh, and if we take a look here at th this is, we are inside of op write, um, and now we're breaking at this, this inker link uh, function call. Before a call to malloc, right, dispatch pointer looks fine. Like this is the, the symbols are, are being like, this is correct, right? Um, and if we look at like some strings around that area where that dispatch pointer is, or where cur device dot out is, um, there's nothing really reasonable. After a call to malloc, there's this macro that gets called that uses the output that it gets from malloc. And if we check IO cur device after that, now all of a sudden there's a string written there, right? So we're overwriting some data that's in that that cur device, that, uh, or IO cur device, right? And the dispatch pointer now is just completely clobbered. Like it is just nonsense. And if you look at the rest of this, like th all of these have been just completely destroyed. So let me rerun that again 
And this time we're going to step into that call to malloc to like figure out like what the malloc is actually doing. Right? So here's our completely normal call to malloc. We step in and we are not in malloc. This is GTM malloc. They wrote their own malloc. Uh, and uh, replaced the system malloc with it. So if I break at uh, another macro later inside of this like custom malloc, there's this call to like get queued element that gets some piece of memory that starts around like E200. Ignore like, you know, 55555, somewhere on the heap, E200, right? And if I look at where uh, curdevice.out is, it is at E210. So there's 16 bytes between those two, right? So before that crashing call, before that call to, to, to uh, yeah, before like the, the crash that happens on Operite, IO Cur device is well formed and it's at a memory address that, that uh, ends with E210, right? There's this call to malloc that goes to GTM malloc instead of glibc malloc and like eventually returns this memory address that ends in E200, right? The devs have made their own memory allocator inside of the heap that like manages, there is the heap memory allocator and then there is their memory allocator managing the same locations in memory, right? Um, there's at least two memory allocators in use on this application, uh, which is just super wild. And by like a little bit of some magic, you can get that second memory allocator to return overlapping chunks, basically. Um, so just to do this a little bit visually, on the, uh, the far left here, we have the way that like, you know, process memory is laid out. You've got, you know, the, the text at low addresses, you've got the memory, you've got the heap, and then there's like the heap, right? The heap is made up of chunks, like memory that is either allocated, in which case it's labeled chunk, or it's freed, like, and the, the memory allocator can, you know, do whatever it wants to it, right? Um, if we take a look at one of those chunks, uh, we've just got some memory that we can use for whatever. During initialization, gt.m and yadadb allocate a chunk, a really big chunk, and then they just say like, this is the memory that we are going to use for any mumps program that's written, right? So then when the, uh, when IO cur device runs, it like, or when GTM runs, it initializes this IO cur device somewhere in that same memory space. And then that GTM malloc returns a similar looking memory space and they overwrite that IO cur device. So you have in one part of the code, like the code thinking that we're looking at the input and output device. And in a different part of the code, they, they think it's a routine header, right? Which lets us get that like overlapping chunks type confusion thing. So basically we have these two like mechanisms that are managing memory, malloc and GTM malloc. And then we get like a type confusion bug in the way that GTM malloc specifically is handling that memory. Uh, so like this is a, a heap bug inside of a memory manager that is managing memory managed by a different memory manager. So like, yeah, the address there is not completely random, but it's not really in our control. Um, and I just, I really wanted to talk about this bug in particular because it's just so fucking weird. It's so weird. Um, so yeah. So yeah, that's what we got looking at like the, you know, looking at, at mumps, the mumps implementations themselves, right? So what about that source review where we were just looking at Vista, right? This next slide I have to read really carefully. Um, the source code review just looked at like, just was looking for quick wins and only looked at like the off mechanisms, input handling, like how it interacts with the underlying system. So that RPC mechanism I was talking about that the clients use is gated by a encryption mechanism that uses roll your own encryption from the 90s, right? So if you deploy uh, Vista without TLS, creds are poorly encrypted and transmitted in a way that attackers can trivially decrypt them or simply replay the packets. There also appears to be hard-coded creds in the source, but because of some like particulars, I'm not super sure that they can be used. Um, and I would absolutely love to explain to you how this works, uh, but we had some problems disclosing this. Uh, so let me show you my disclosure timeline real fast. So on January 3rd, we sent an email to the VA at following their, their disclosure policy. We received an automated email that said somebody will email you back. Nobody emailed us back. So then like on the 10th, I emailed them, I sent them another email that said, hey, 
there's some problems. I really want to talk to you about these. They sent another automated email, no follow-up. We never got another email from the VA after this. Uh, and then on the 10th, I sent another email and got nothing, right? So like, I assume that they, you know, either something changed on their back end or they like just blocked my email address, so cool. Um, so then I reached out to somebody I know who works at the DHS. They did not respond. Um, I then reached out to CISA directly. They also did not respond. And then I called CISA on the phone. This is a thing that you can do. Their phone number is on the internet. You can find them and call them. Uh, and somehow, I think because of a phone tree thing, that call just got disconnected like before I could ever speak to somebody and like explain what the hell was going on. So then I called CISA again, and I was told that any information that I give them is just not going to be provided to the VA. Like they're not going to like give it to the people to try to fix the bug, right? They said they were going to give it to their, th their threat hunting teams. So then I reached out to CMU CERT, uh, and I received an email that was like, hey, give me more details. And then they didn't respond to responses to that email. Um, this says they never responded. Within the last week, they have started responding. Um, but I don't believe they, they yeah, the, I'm not super sure what's going on there. I, don't, I still don't think the VA has been told about this, this problem. Um, and I want to be clear, like, this is an EMR that is deployed in, like, it is at VA hospitals right now, right? It is also at civilian hospitals in the United States, right? Um, so yeah, also we, like, disclose a lot of bugs to a bunch of uh, uh, mumps distributions. Uh, for YadaDB, we sent them an email that was like, hey, like, we, we found some, some bugs. They sent us an email back that was like, cool, do you mind teaching us how to do this? And I said, hell yeah. Um, and then we explained to them like, hey, here's how you fuzz, here's like the changes you need to make, like, you know. And then they started fuzzing and they've got, they found tons and tons and tons of bugs. Um, and then by like, you know, February, we, we just closed to them in November, by February, new version was out that had all the fixes in it. Uh, GT.M, we sent them an email in, in December, by March they had like fixed all of the bugs. Um, so yeah, that's the, that's our disclosure there. So what does this all mean, right? Um, when I first like started looking at this, this, uh, this research, like I've done a lot of fuzzing projects and never found anything. You know, I always kind of figured that like, oh, you know, all the fun memory corruption bugs are dead, right? Nope. There's still big stuff out there that has real, real kind of obvious memory corruption bugs. Um, Mumps isn't really going to go anywhere. I, I think at this point we're sort of, we're, we're stuck with it. Uh, when Mumps first got like off the ground and people started using it for stuff, it was faster than everything. It was cutting edge. It was innovative. It was everything you want. Um, and like a lot of companies jumped on this bandwagon and are still there. Core banking uses Mumps. You know, a bunch of healthcare stuff uses Mumps outside of just Vista. Uh, like I said, the ESA uses Mumps. Based on some numbers that I've seen, more than 50% of healthcare records in the United States pass through like some application that's written in this language at some point. Um, and yeah, there's like, there's still we more weird machines out there to break. You know, there's like, there's still like more stuff to find, right? So what should you do? Like if you're working on Vista or a Vista derived product or something like that, make sure you're deploying TLS everywhere. Um, this... Deploying TLS is not like difficult on a lot of months implementations, but it's not trivial. Um, and like, just make sure, even internally, do not trust that you're just behind, you're inside of like your VLANs and everything's fine. Like, make sure you've got TLS everywhere. Um, if you deploy months or a months based product, uh, you need to update. If you're using gt.m from apt, like I said to do earlier, you're four versions behind and you're two versions behind the uh, patch that has all of the fixes to the bugs that were disclosed. So, you know, update basically. Probably build from source. Uh, and if you're a hacker looking for research, like I can't think of like look at healthcare stuff. Like there's people are, healthcare stuff is still not getting the eyes on it that it needs. Like look at healthcare stuff. Um, also, if you work at the VA, send me an email. Like, I, I don't, yeah, this shouldn't be this hard, you know? <laughs> um, but yeah, I just want to like, I, I've just trashed this language and this product for like, you know, at this point, like 40 minutes. And I just want to say that like, everybody who worked on this is a hero to me. Like, I am not kidding about this. Like, looking at some of this code, you see these names that are like, these people that are wizards, right? Mumps was this incredible idea that like 
was just like, hey, we have computers now. Like, what can we do for healthcare stuff? And they made this incredible thing that is still in use that you can still play around with and still learn. It's not exactly an esoteric language, but if you're looking for a new SOLang, look at mumps. There's, it's neat. Um, Vista as like the EMR is super well re uh, respected. It's really flexible. There's a story about like the VA has just been in constant scandal forever, forever and ever. Um, and there's a story about how the, uh, like during some bad times, uh, they basically like, there was this, this congressional testimony that was like, oh, you know, everything over there is broken except for that EMR. That EMR is the best EMR I have ever seen. And a bunch of doctors were, have said this about moms. Um, and I like, just as like a fun little side thing, it was, so Vista got named Vista in like 1994, which is like almost 30 years ago now. Um, and the reason why they called it Vista is because previously they were calling it DHCP, um, which then, you know, led to be a problem. I think it stands for like dis dist distributed healthcare program or something like that. Um, and they renamed it to Vista, capital V, capital A. And I'm sure at the time they were like, this is the greatest name. No, no one will ever scoop us on this name. Why the hell would you call something Vista? You know, uh, and then, you know, a decade later, here comes uh, uh, Bill Gates' Microsoft.com. Um, so yeah, that's, that's slide 63 of 64. Here's slide 63 and a half. Uh, this is my greet slide. Uh, thank you for having me. Like I, I, this really means a lot to me, this, this community and like everybody who has st stood on the stage and all of the research that everyone who has ever gone to DEF CON has ever done has been a great like inspiration to me. Um, yeah, thanks to everybody at SI, thanks to, you know, just everybody who helped out on this. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for your time. That's kind of, that's everything I got. Uh, you can yell at me at Twitter. Uh, that's it. Yeah. Thank you. You're my hero. All right. Oh yeah. Also my, my Twitter account is the word binaries backwards. Um, which yeah, it's just doesn't look like it doesn't look like it, but it is. Cool. Yeah. Are we do we have time for questions? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah. Yeah, any questions? Anybody have any questions? All right. I have I have absolutely killed the crowd. Hell yeah. All right. Yeah, like I said, go go look at mumps. It's it's a fun language. It's real weird. Um, there is there's a lot of multi billion dollar companies that deploy stuff that's written in mumps. So like there's there's some fun stuff out there. What's up? Uh, there is not. The question is, is there a Wireshark decode for the RPC? There is not. Um, there is a. Uh, a long dead. I think there is there is a git commit. I can't remember what project it's on for a JS file that I think is called RPC Snoop, which you're not. That's going to be difficult to find. But like, look for RPC Snoop in relation to Vista, and hopefully you'll find it. It's a Node.js file that was uh, floating around. Um, yeah, cool. Any other questions? All right. Thank you very much.